Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm David Knight. It's Wednesday, September 28th, 2016. Here are our top stories. Tonight. Diplomatic immunity. More questions emerge about the FBI's special handling of Hillary Clinton's email case. Meanwhile, Roger Stone gets the full McCarthy treatment from the House. This is uh, the new McCarthyism. I mean, Congressman Jerry Nadler is a pathetic hack uh, and a shill for Hillary Clinton, willing to overlook all of her illegal activities to try to launch a witch hunt to non-existent uh, activities. Then, no Skittles, please. Donald Trump Jr. compares refugees to poison Skittles, and Twitter reacts with a copyright violation. All that plus much more up next on the InfoWars Nightly News. Well, today, FBI Director James Comey was called before the House committee to answer questions about why Hillary Clinton isn't in jail. And he didn't have some very good answers, but some of the things that he said, or some of the things that were said by one of the congressmen there, hit pretty close to home. We're going to have that for you in just a moment. But first of all, before he went there, even the Wall Street Journal was talking about James Comey and the immunity that he had given to Hillary Clinton. They said that uh, Comey will appear today, and they said his private email server investigation is looking more like a kid glove exercise. Everybody can see the criminality behind this. Comey laid out a case for multiple felonies and then said he would be crazy to prosecute her. There is no exception for intent. And we've said this over and over again. And furthermore, we have seen whistleblowers and journalists prosecuted by this administration, by the Obama administration, using the 1917 Espionage Act more than every other president in the last 100 years combined. And yet when you have someone who has committed more felonies against national security than anyone else, Hillary Clinton, she's given a pass. And the fact that these emails were uh, not marked, as she said, that, that's not true. Comey clearly said they were marked as classified. And yet, offering that as an excuse still doesn't excuse her. They came after Thomas Drake, one of the NSA whistleblowers, for emails that never should have been classified. And they said, you should have known these were classified. They should have been classified. They classified them and then unclassified them and dropped the prosecution. But they were trying to send Drake... An NSA whistleblower to jail for 30 some odd years. Now, the newest revelations show that immunity was extended to some of Clinton's top aides. That would be Cheryl Mills, her chief of staff, as well as senior advisor Heather Samuelson. In order to get them to surrender their laptops, think about that. And as they pointed out, they said, why would they do this courtesy? If the FBI wanted anybody else's laptops, they would simply take them. But for these two, they grant them immunity. Now, typically, immunity is granted if you're trying to get information to prosecute the people who are the real masterminds of the crime. But we've seen this with the Clintons before. When Charlie Tree was granted immunity, they found out all the information, all the graft and the corruption involving the Clintons, and yet they didn't use this testimony to go after the Clintons either. No, if you're a minion of the Clintons, you simply get a pass. And I think it needs to be said that one of the minions of the Clintons is Comey himself. This is a man, along with Attorney General Loretta Lynch, who were part of a law firm that did the Clintons' taxes. Uh, it was Lynch and, uh, that let HSBC, one of the major money launderers, convicted multiple times, but they didn't send anybody to jail. They said they're too big to jail. And of course, Comey came to this position with the FBI having served on the board of HSBC. And of course, the two of them had joined earlier to let another Clinton crony Sandy Berger escaped when he went into the National Archives, plundered documents, and destroyed them to cover up for the Clintons. Now, this is also interesting. One of the, the person who represents both of them, Beth Wilkinson, said that both Ms. Mills and Ms. Samuelson say the immunity deals were designed to protect their clients against any related classification disputes. This, the Wall Street Journal says, is an admission that both women knew their unsecured laptops had been holding sensitive information for more than a year. Meanwhile, they say on Friday, the FBI dumped another 189 pages of documents. That is what we continually see. And as he was called today to uh, answer for why he is not trying to put Hillary Clinton in prison, he said uh, one of the things they questioned him on were the latest revelations of the cover-up as we had uh, someone who was working 
Hillary Clinton as an IT personnel, saying that he needed some help, asking people on Reddit for help to destroy some documents for a VIP. And again, Comey says, nothing to see here, move on. And then goes on to say, don't call us weasels. You may think that we're wrong, but we're not weasels. No, actually, I think, <laughs> I think they are weasels. They're far worse than weasels. They are co-conspirators with Hillary Clinton and the largest violation of national security that we have ever seen. Yet we have an operative for Hillary Clinton, Congressman Nadler, who goes after Roger Stone. In his early remarks, uh, Mr. Kanye's referenced an August 30th letter from the ranking members of a number of House committees. That letter asked whether the FBI was investigating troubling connections between Trump campaign officials and Russian interests, and whether they contributed to the illegal hacking of the Democratic National Committee and the Democratic uh, Na National Campaign Committee. You're familiar with that letter, I take it? Yes, I'm familiar with the letter. I'd like to ask you a few questions. The letter said this, and I quote, On August 8th, 2016, Roger Stone, a Donald Trump confidant, revealed that he has communicated with WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange about the upcoming release of additional, illeg of additional illegally hacked Democratic documents. Mr. Stone made these statements during a Republican campaign event while answering a question about a potential October surprise. Obviously, if someone is stating publicly that he is in direct communication with the organization that obtained these illegally hacked documents, I assume the FBI would want to talk to that person. Has the FBI interviewed Roger Stone about his communications with Julian Assange or his knowledge of how WikiLeaks got these illegally obtained documents? I can't comment on that. Mr. Stone stated that he has knowledge about upcoming leaks of additional illegally hacked documents. Has the FBI asked him about those communications? I also can't comment on that. Because it's an ongoing investigation? I don't want to confirm whether there is or is not an investigation. That, that's, why, that's the way I answered Mr. Conyers' questions as well. Director Comey, the FBI acknowledged in private, in public statements and testimony that it was, acknowledged that it was investigating Secretary Clinton's use of a private email server, and that was while the investigation was still ongoing. Now you can't comment on whether there's an investigation. Is there a different standard for Secretary Clinton and Donald Trump? If not, what is the consistent standard? No, our standard is we do not confirm or deny the existence of investigations. There's an exception for that when there is a need for the public to be reassured. Obviously, it's apparent given our activities, public activities, that the investigation is ongoing. But our overwhelming rule is we do not comment except in uh, That's enough. We're going to go to break. What do you say to the charge of we're working for the Ruskies? Well, this would be laughable if it wasn't so outrageous. This is the, the new McCarthyism. I mean, Congressman Jerry Nadler is a pathetic hack uh, and a shill for Hillary Clinton, willing to overlook all of her legal activities to try to launch a witch hunt to non-existent uh, activities. I have no connections to the Russians. I don't work for the Russians. I'm not in touch with the Russians. I am not compensated by the Russians. My loyalties to the United States of America. If the FBI would like to investigate my ties to WikiLeaks or the Russians, they're welcome to do so. They'll find nothing untoward or illegal. Uh, I have, as I've said on this program many times, had a back channel communications with Assange through an intermediary simply for the purpose of gleaning information as to what he may or may not have. And by the way, you got hacked, you're bag everything because of that. Yes, but you know, I didn't hear from the FBI when I got hacked uh, or when they uh, destroyed my contacts uh, or uh, destroyed other uh, investigative documents I was working on or invaded my bank account where there were actual thefts of thousands of dollars in illegal transfers. The FBI didn't seem to be too concerned about that. Uh, on August 21st, a bunch of Democratic hacks co-signed a letter to Comey demanding that I be investigated. These are intimidation tactics that will not work. And let me ask you this question. I mean, obviously, we brought this up privately, uh, but just you know, in a vague way that we were both under investigation. I've been told this, too, before this even came out. And it's, I'm just sitting here. I'm not even upset about it. It's so ridiculous that I'm a Russian spy. I mean, give me a break. Well, as Nietzsche said, that which does not kill me makes me stronger. Alex, every time they attack you, and Hillary Clinton attacked you by name in a speech,
which I'm jealous about, I've got to be honest, they're only boosting your viewership, which I think has probably tripled in the last couple of weeks. Every time they attack you, they just underline the fact that you're a truth teller. And again, you can see the full interview with Roger Stone, his comments, Alex Jones's comments on the InfoWars article, Democrats pressure FBI to investigate Trump ally Roger Stone. Now, Roger Stone was right to call this new McCarthyism. As a matter of fact, many people on the left have called these types of attacks and the, uh, the attempts to link Trump with Putin a kind of McCarthyism. But it's the authoritarian left that simply wants to censor people. Understand that Roger Stone had talked to Assange just as Sean Hannity talked to Assange about uh, Assange saying that he has upcoming documents that are going to be released in October. That's what journalists do. Are they going to investigate Sean Hannity next? And when we look at the associations that they try to put out there, understand that uh, they say that Trump is a Putin surrogate simply because Putin said some diplomatic things about Donald Trump. They also say that Trump loves the KKK because David Duke said he liked Donald Trump. Remember that Donald Trump said I didn't he didn't want to get involved with the Reform Party when they had people from the Ku Klux Klan like David Duke joining them. There was speculation that Donald Trump was going to run at one time as a Reform Party candidate. He says, no, there's Ku Klux Klan people in there. So that's clearly a smear tactic. But if you want to take that tactic, then let's take a look at Hillary Clinton and the people who like Hillary Clinton. Remember the mall shooting in uh, Washington? We had uh, Arkan Seton said, uh, and the Cascade Mall suspect said he supported Hillary Clinton and ISIS. He said, uh, I voted for her. He said, uh, we win, I vote for Hillary Clinton. He also suggested that Hillary Clinton should be on the new $10 bill in some of his posts. He also included Hitler's wife in the list, okay? I guess that's because radical Muslims are also anti-Semitic. And then he puts up pictures of Abu Bakr al-Big Daddy, al hashtag al-Qaeda, and says, my main dude. This is a guy who loves Hillary Clinton. Is Hillary going to disavow this ISIS terrorist who says that he loves ISIS, who murdered people? That's the game that they play. Understand that it is not just James Comey who is covering up for Hillary Clinton. She's got a network of cronies that the Clintons and the Democrats have put out throughout the government. Here's another example. On Friday, again, we learned that uh, a judge said that he was going to hold Hillary Clinton's emails, the vast majority of them, until after the election. Judge James Boasberg on Friday ordered the State Department to finish processing 1,050 pages of material for release by November 4th, just days before the election. That'll probably be a Friday. I'd have to take a look at it, but it's probably a Friday. Again, they always dump these out on a Friday. And that's just a fraction of 10,000 pages of material. Who is this guy? This is a guy that was appointed by Barack Obama. This is a guy who ruled in 2012 that the public had no right to view government photos of a supposedly dead Osama bin Laden shutting down a FOIA request by Judicial Watch. And this is a guy who is one of the FISA judges presiding over the security state. And yet he is covering for the largest felony violations of the security state we have ever seen. Now, as I said before, the tactics of the authoritarian left are not to debate, but to censor. And we see another example of this, not only with Michael Savage, but with Donald Trump Jr.'s tweet pointing out the truth of our open borders policy. He had a photograph of a bowl of Skittles and said, what if I gave you a bowl of Skittles, told you three of these were poison, would you take a handful? That is essentially what is happening with our open borders, the immigration policies, bringing people in from Syria. And now that has been censored, saying that they have a copyright claim over the picture that was used in that meme. Understand, that is fair use. Political use is fair use. Parody is fair use. Both of those were in play here, but that's not what they're looking at. They're looking at censorship. And of course, we can see that with Michael Savage. And we've got a clip of uh, Michael Savage coming up in the next section. He was on just two weeks ago talking to Alex Jones. And on Monday before the debate, he was censored. First by the New York station as he started to talk about Hillary Clinton's health. And then when he learned that the New York station had shut him down and put somebody else on and started to talk about it, he was shut down nationally over 400 stations, and they went to a replay. But understand that it is not just the mainstream media, and it's not just the surrogates of Hillary Clinton that are trying to control the information. We also had the Pope come out and say that journalism based, is based, that's based on fear-mongering and gossip is a form of terrorism. Now, he didn't use the terms conspiracy theory. That's what typically people use when you 
question the government's official story or you do actual investigation or you say something that the left doesn't like, they brand you as a conspiracy theorist. Now the Pope is saying, well, you may be fear mongering, you may be gossiping, and that is a kind of terrorism. Reuters reported that the Pope said spreading rumors is an example of terrorism or how you can kill a person with your tongue, he said. This is even more true for journalists because their voice can reach everyone and this is a very powerful weapon. He said weapons of destruction against persons and even entire peoples. He goes on to say journalism should not foment fear before events. So if you analyze, if you talk about trends, maybe you're a conspiracy theorist or a gossiper or a rumor monger, okay? But you are a terrorist, according to the Pope. One example that they gave in the article, they said, last year, a right-wing newspaper headlined a story on the Paris attacks that killed 130 people saying Islamic bastards. So there you go. It's more offensive to call them Islamic bastards than the actual attack that was carried out by the Islamic bastards. The Pope, of course, is selling a globalist agenda. And the Christian Post has pointed out globalism is antichrist, demonic. They say that, as the New York Times reported last Monday, and I pointed that out until relatively recently, few people would refer to themselves as globalists. And they have a couple of different definitions. And I would say they're not just definitions. I would say rather what they talk about is an implementation of globalism, but then they talk about the philosophy behind it. And here's how they summarize that. They say globalism is a secular humanistic religion of sorts that envisions a one world government. Very good definition. Stay with us when we come back. Alex Jones and Michael Savage two weeks ago predicting the censorship we saw two days ago. We'll be right back. If you look at the globalists, if you look at their leftists, they're saying the alt-right can't be tolerated. They're saying we need to be shut down and arrested. Hillary says she's going to shut down Breitbart. That means Drudge, you. They say they're bringing back fairness doctrine. They say they're coming after us. They're run by this foreign globalist Soros. Russia's already kicked him out. These are foreign globalists here overthrowing our country. So under the Constitution, these aren't even citizens. They don't have the rights. They're here overthrowing the system. To survive, we must go on the offensive. We must root them out. It's the only way to ever beat them. They are criminals. They are subversives. They are Saul Alinsky pledging to Lucifer. Please continue. Now, the man behind all of it is George Soros, the most evil man on the planet in my estimation, the absolutely most evil person the world has seen in modern times. You know, you don't have to hang people, electrocute them, put them in cages. You don't have to do the things that ISIS is doing to be evil. He's evil on a larger scale than the ISIS executioners are because he's gutting the United States of America. He's trampling on our Constitution. He he's helped fund the, the Arab Spring. He helped fund the Arab Spring. Hillary, all of them. Hillary Clinton was the publicist and an actor along with John Kerry. I'd say she, she was the quarterback with Kerry and Obama. She destroyed the Middle East. She owns that. How does the media, forget the media, why doesn't Trump... Put her on a cross with that and one. And by the way, Mr. It's Savage, Dr. Savage, that's not hyperbole. She literally destabilized 20-something countries that Al-Qaeda and ISIS are running around. Hundreds of thousands of dead Christians. They won't even let Christians out of the region. It's, it, it, these people are demons, just like the true liberal Assange said, look, I've got the documents. The press is dead if she gets in. Our necks are in nooses. She's a demon. You must stop her. I hear you. And I also saw who wrote the other day that Obama, the nice, slick, smooth, nice family man, has created the greatest surveillance state in the history of the world. And suddenly liberals are afraid of it because they understand what happens when the guillotine uh, stops, starts falling. First, it takes out your opposition. But as, um, as the world learned during the French Revolution, the, the guillotine has an unlimited taste for blood. And it doesn't stop with the enemies of the revolution. Then they turn on their own kind and start executing their own so, so-called counter-revolutionaries, as was done in the Soviet Union. Always happens. As was, done in, as was done in Cuba, as was done in Hitler's Germany. They kill their own. The brown shirts. And the, the guillotine keeps falling and cuts heads. It is the most thirsty instrument on earth. And that's why the left ought to step up and shut their fat mouths when we stand up to these monsters. These monsters need to be stopped or we're all finished. Left, right, and center. You mentioned a key word there, Google. For weeks, I've been railing against the monopolies that have emerged in America under Obama, the dictator. Google, Facebook, uh, Microsoft, of course, had been there before. Look at these companies. They're violating the antitrust statutes of the United States legal system. There is an antitrust division of the U.S. Justice Department that does not touch Mark Zuckerberg, does not touch the Google boys, does not touch Bill Gates. 
And there's a reason. Because they all support the globalist New World Order agenda. They support it to the nth degree. And I've been screaming that when Trump becomes president, he must reactivate and use the Justice Department to break up these monopolies and give other people a chance to build a business. And I make a, a point of Teddy Roosevelt, who was a populist, as you well know, and his campaign slogan was, bust the trusts. The trusts in his day were Standard Oil, Rockefeller's Railroads, an oil company, company that dominated railroads and dominated the oil business. They didn't give anyone a chance of emerging. If they did, they crushed it. And it's the same globalist grandkids today that are running globalism. Zuckerberg, $58 billion isn't enough for that pig. He needs to cut the wages of American workers and throw them out of the country and bring in Indians who work for one third the wage. God bless India. God bless their intelligence. God bless India. But we got to look out for us a little bit. They, they belong in India. Let them, let them rebuild their own economy and let them hire IT workers at a right, at a right salary. So, yeah, you want to talk about jobs. Why do you think, no, not you, I'm talking rhetorically. Listen, sure. Why do you think Trump is surging amongst the blue-collar, disenfranchised white male? Why? Because they've been dumped upon. They've been stepped upon. The Eddies, whose grandfathers defeated Hitler. The Eddies, whose fathers died in the jungles of Vietnam, are being crapped upon by these vermin, these cowardly vermin, these sick, deviant perverts. I can't stand it. I'll get worked up, and I don't want to. I'm trying not to, Alex. This is the first interview I've done wow. for this book. Thank you. And, and Alex, I got to tell you, you're, the, you're on the front lines. You're going to be around a lot longer than I am in the media and probably on this planet. And you're doing the job that needs to be done. And all I can say is, as the time comes to an end right here, when I say that Obama and the left are practicing a scorched earth policy, there's a reason for it. When an army retreated in the past, they burnt everything to the ground. They burnt the crops. They killed the livestock. They burned the barns. They burned earth. The Is that not what's going on here with this left when they see an ascendant right and ascendant American? That's right. They're movement. blowing it all up. They're burning, our, they're burning our pathways to survival. They're burning our internet. They want to burn radio. They want to burn any access. They're trying to, to start a race war. They're saying kill the cops. They're getting away with everything. I keep saying, Soros gave them $70 million to those street thugs? All we need now is Obama to uh, turn them into his well-funded private army. He can deputize them and give them government arms as he did ISIS. And then you will have the young pioneers of the Soviet Union. You will have the Red Brigades. You will have the Red Brigades of Communist China frightening everybody in the society. Uh, on a daily basis. We cannot continue to rely only on our military in order to achieve the national security objectives that we've set. We've got to have a civilian national security force that's just as powerful, just as strong, just as well funded. Alex, we're that close to it all coming to that. Obama is not finished yet. He has several months left yet to burn it all down, Alex. I agree. We've only got a minute left then. In your gut, you're a smart cookie, Dr. Savage. What do you expect them to pull? Remember what George Bush did in the last few months of his regime? I was screaming and warning George Bush is a fiscal socialist. He's not through yes. Do you remember the housing yes. crisis that followed? I expect that if it looks like Trump is going to win or, or, or grandma falls off the stage again for good and they replace her with uh, uh, Freddie from one of the nightmare movies, Kane, who can't win, uh, I expect the worst. I expect them calling off the election. I expect martial law. I expect if that is not possible, I expect a financial, complete financial breakdown to create even further chaos. That's what I expect. I've always been for free speech to the most radical level. The problem is they're all organizing and saying they want to shut down talk radio. They want to shut down Matt Drudge. They want to shut down Breitbart. Hillary says the alt-right, that means Michael Savage is the dean, does not have a right to exist. When you start hearing final solution, literal Nazi rhetoric that I don't have a right to exist, I've got a black heart, you're evil, Matt Drudge is evil, I'm done. Listen, you come here, you overthrow the country, you bring in radical Muslims, you want to arrest me, the gloves are off, we're going to try you in front of a jury, then we're going to lock your asses up. You want well, we it? Order. We're going to find out who the traitors are. Go ahead. Alex, you know, the left was famous at agit Agitprop. I believe after this election, whoever wins, we need to have a people's tribunal and have mock trials of Hillary Clinton, John Kerry, George Soros, all of the names that we know are involved with destroying our sovereignty and going after our First Amendment. 
There's nothing prohibiting such agit prop. You can be the prosecutor. Who? You. No, I'm not good as a lawyer. I can't even imitate lawyers. But the <laughs> thing is, <laughs> Alex, listen, we got to slow down. There's a lot of work to be done because if Trump wins, and it looks like he could easily win unless they do one of two things, and I'm terrified of either of the options. One is the most horrible possibility. If it looks like he's going to beat her, you know they're not letting him get to the finish line. Let's let that hang in the air. Number two, let us say he wins. Well, what happens then? He is surrounded by neocons. They have already triangulated Trump. You saw that last week. He already brought in the, I think it was on your show last week, the former head of the CIA under, was it, uh, uh, huh? Uh, came out and criticized uh, 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 Trump. The former head of the CIA under, under, under uh, uh, Clinton. He's using him as an advisor? You're right. It was, it was sure, that, that's uh, Woolsey. Yes. Yes, Woolsey. Why would he choose him? I'm already concerned about the whole... Trump will be on my radio show today, by the way, Good. Alex. He's, he's scheduled to be on. And we're going to talk about terror, 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 terror. He's called for profiling today, incidentally. Which, of course, is commonsensical, isn't it? Every cop in the world... I love the newspaper articles in the San Francisco area. They never show a perp unless he's got blonde hair and blue eyes. Uh, can't find the perpetrator. You have to search. By the way, in Sweden and Germany, they admit that even when it's a Muslim, they replace it with a blurred out image of a blonde haired German. And, and I interrupted you earlier when you were talking about how we go after subversives. When you're a multinational war criminal, former Nazi collaborator that's collapsed dozens of countries like George Soros. I have two words for you. Predator drones. <laughs> You will never see it coming. <laughs> you think I'm joking? Yeah, you'll never see it coming. And they hope you don't see the Islamic terrorists coming in that they're bringing in from Syria and other places as well. In many cases, inspired by collateral damage from those very drone strikes. But when they do go after terrorists, and there is a connection with a terrorist event here, they do everything they can to cover it up. Now we find out that the FBI was covering up and lying to the American public, concealing the fact that the Orlando shooter said that he was, he was shooting uh, the people at the uh, gay bar because of a drone strike. This is from the Washington Free Beacon. Orlando terror attack triggered by a Pentagon drone strike. They say the domestic terror behind the Orlando nightclub massacre was motivated by a Pentagon drone strike in Iraq a month before the shooting, according to police transcripts, which were made public last week. Guess when they made them public? The FBI always likes to dump this information on a Friday. And it has taken several days for that information to percolate around because they dumped this out on Friday. It kept secret until Friday, even though it happened back on June the 12th. They say the secrecy contributed to misleading media accounts of the terrorists' motives in the days after the killings. Well, it wasn't really that we didn't know, okay? We knew that from the very beginning. Yet the mainstream media and the Obama administration were covering this up and putting out that there were different motivations. Now, this is an attack, if you remember, that killed 49 people. They say the uh, police department negotiator was talking on the phone to Martin at the time, because this was a standoff that went on for quite some time, said, uh, tell me what's going on. He says, uh, yo, the airstrike that killed Abu Wabid, Wahib a few weeks ago. He said, that's what triggered it, okay, said Martin. He said, they should not have bombed and killed Abu. Okay, now, the New York Times had reported even three days later that the precise motive of Martin remains unclear. They knew, and we knew that it was Islamic, even if he was attacking these people simply because they were homosexuals. We knew from the past of his father and others they had called for the execution of homosexuals. That's what Islam is about. But it was even more precise than that. As they pointed out in this analysis, Sebastian Gorka, a counterterrorism expert, said the 9-11 transcript completely destroys the White House policy narrative of so-called lone wolf terror attacks. He says Omar Mateen isn't a random individual discontented from a broader conspiracy. He said justifying the attack as a response to our targeting of Abu Wahib, the ISIS head of Al-Anbar Lions, reemphasizes to reality that this is a borderless war in which the individual neutralization of high-value targets will not bring us ultimate victory. No, in reality, these surgical strikes, as they're so-called, 
are simply motivating many people to become terrorists in the first place. And these other countries, look at this report from Mitt Press, a journalist suing the CIA over a drone attack that killed his son. Now, this is a Pakistani journalist. He sued the U.S. government, saying the CIA is responsible for the deaths of his brother and his son, who were killed in a drone attack in his home December 2009. He says his brother and 16-year-old son had no links to terror groups, were innocently killed by the U.S., similar to dozens of other victims in recent years. It's far more than dozens, folks. Adding the CIA drone operations would only fuel hate and help to create more terrorists, which we then bring into this country. See, they incite and then they immigrate the terrorists into our country. They don't want you to see the connections when they come into this country between the attacks that are carried out and the fact that it is Islamicist terrorists who are doing it. He says they tell the whole world that they're killing terrorists and drone strikes, but in fact, they are killing innocent people, says the journalist who is suing the CIA. Meanwhile, today we see the Senate has overridden Obama's veto of the Compensation Act for families of uh, victims of 9-11. The Senate on Wednesday voted to override President Obama's veto of a bill that would allow the families of 9-11 victims to sue Saudi Arabia, striking a blow to the president on foreign policy months before he leaves office. As a matter of fact, this is the first time in Obama's administration that he's been overridden on anything. Isn't that amazing that our Congress, with a majority of Republicans in both the House and the Senate, have been so supine to the overreaches of Obama that this is the only time and they did the right thing in overriding him but it's the only time they could muster the will to override Obama now they had unanimously passed this bill before today it was 97 to 1 in the Senate Obama only picked up one supporter in the Senate and a few hours later the house overrode Obama's veto 348 to 77 meanwhile before this happened we had defense secretary Ash Carter lobbying on Congress saying that this would be devastating to the military. Well, why would it be devastating to the military to compensate, uh, allow 9-11 uh, victims to try to get compensation if they can prove a terror connection with the Saudis? And this is going to be very difficult for them to prove. This is 15 years later that they have covered this up and uh, pushed this to the background. So now 15 years after the fact, with all of the evidence destroyed as it was very quickly after 9-11, they're gonna try to have to prove this. Nevertheless, they didn't like this. They said it sets a bad example. Of course it does. Because we can be sued for the crimes that we commit in other countries, like bombing innocent people. They say Carter's opposition was because he thought it would be an intrusive discovery process that would potentially damage our war on terror. Well, how would it damage our war on terror? Would it be that we are aiding the terrorists and other countries that we're aiding ISIS. Uh, this article points out the Syrian Al Qaeda leader today said that groups are receive that his group is receiving money and weapons and logistics from the United States. This was an interview with a German newspaper, and uh, this is a journalist from uh, Germany who has traveled to Syria for the seventh time during this proxy war that's been going on for the last five years. Now. This guy, who is a, a jihadist commander fighting in the strategic city of Aleppo, Abu al ez said the Americans stand on our side. He said they still support the group with weapons, money, and logistics. And the Americans came back and said, no, 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 we would never do that. They, it was so damaging they had to respond to that. They said the U.S. is arming Nusra. Uh, we're not arming Nusra, however, but our allies might. That's what the State Department says. Well, we have seen other proof that they have been armed. Meanwhile... The Americans say they're not arming al-Nusra, yet al-Nusra says that they are. Who is al-Nusra? Al-Qaeda, al-Nusra, ISIS, they're all the same thing. Even CNN says this. CNN says al-Nusra is rebranding. This is just a month ago. They said new name, but same aim. What you need to know. They say the organization claims the move is meant to foster unification among rebel factions, but the U.S. and others say it is just a PR exercise. Meanwhile, we know that America is acting as al-Qaeda's Air Force. We have uh, an ISIS in uh, Syria. We reported on September 17th that the U.S. had attacked troops that were amassing to counterattack ISIS. And this was at a base that had long been a Syrian air base. Now we have reports coming out of RT and others saying that Damascus says that they have proof that the U.S. coordinated these attacks with ISIS militants ahead of the strikes. They say the Syrian army intercepted communications between Americans and ISIS ahead of the attack. They say they're going to release this information. This is something we have seen over and over again, accidentally releasing arms to al-Qaeda. 
saying we didn't really mean to uh, take out that uh, convoy there. This was a devastating attack. They decimated this force that was protecting a city and stopped not only the counterattack, but then exposed the city that was being protected to attack by ISIS. Clearly, America is operating as ISIS's air force. And understand that ISIS is the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria. Another article points out the U.S. policy may soon lead Iraq into a Syrian-style civil war. Now, this is after Hillary has said and emphasized this over and over again. There are not going to be any new American boots on the ground in Iraq ever. Nevertheless, we reported a couple of weeks ago that there were another four or 500 troops going to join several thousand that were already in Iraq. Now another 500 are going in preparation for a massive attack on Mosul. As Dr. Ron Paul has said, the only way anybody could conceive of a mission being accomplished to endorse this policy is if somebody could be thriving on chaos because chaos seems to be winning. That is precisely what is happening here. And as a former veteran from that area said, even if ISIS is eventually eradicated, the absence of a unifying enemy might release pent up animosities and hatred toward current allies. This could potentially unleash an even greater bloodbath in Iraq than what was wrought by ISIS. Chaos indeed. Stay with us when we come back. Owen Shorter is going to take a look at another Clinton crony, David Brock. We'll be right back. Owen Schroyer from Infowars.com. And when my news director came to me and asked me to do a story covering David Brock, I'd heard the name. I knew that he was involved in politics, specifically with the left, but I didn't really know too much about him. And I think that the Democrats want it to stay that way. They don't want you to know who David Brock is. I got to tell you, when I started doing research into this guy, it's truly amazing. This guy is like the Jordan Belfort of political campaign contributions. Unbelievable documentation on money laundering schemes and just a lot of weird history that he has, too. So we're going to get into David Brock, and we're going to try to figure out who this guy really is, what his agendas really are, and how they tie in to Hillary Clinton's campaign. As I said, this is like a Jordan Belfort of political contributions, and he's working closely with Hillary Clinton. And we'll talk about their past um, in a minute here, but look at this, 14 pro-Clinton super PACs and nonprofits that are run by David Brock are all implicated in this money laundering scheme. Now, again, like I said, there is documentation on this that you can go out there and see for yourself. But what this guy is doing is he's using and manipulating all of these different PACs and campaign contribution groups and he's working with a close friend of his that runs the Bonner Group, which takes a 12.5% cut every time money is moved, folks. Why is that? That is a very significant amount of money that he's taking, especially when you take a look at how much money he's actually bringing in. We're talking about millions and millions of dollars. And as I said, he is colluding with his friends in the Bonner Group. Now, of course, David Brock's biggest claim to fame would have to be Media Matters, who brags about how they control the narrative. And I never hear them bragging about how they're making all of this money uh, with all of these super PACs, though. This is part of the Hillary Clinton campaign that says they want to get big money out of politics. But here we go. IRS certified nonprofit empire of David Brock. So he's been certified by the IRS, but he, he has a good way of keeping these things under wraps. And it's amazing, though. There has been no investigation by the Department of Justice. There has been no investigation by the IRS. And there has been no investigation by the media. OK, and we have example on top of example, case after case, proof after proof that David Brock is at the very least guilty of collusion. Now, as I said, this guy is operating uh, nearly a dozen super PACs that are all closely tied in to the Clinton campaign. And what he does is he keeps the Bonner Group as an unregistered professional solicitor. That way, since it's unregistered and not registered, he doesn't have to divulge who is paying these payments out. He does not have to tell you who is giving him all of this money. So he keeps his clients hidden. Why does he want to keep his clients hidden? Media Matters for America, David Box Group, raised over $10 million, and the Bonner Group, was credited for raising those funds and paid a $1.1 million commission by 
media matters, folks. So what is David Brock really in this for? Is he just laundering money? Does he truly have political uh, goals that he's trying to get across? But this is truly un unheard of. And like I said, the Bonner Group is run by Mary Pat Bonner, a rich Democratic donor with whom Brock shares rental property with in the Hamptons. So these people are closely tied to each other. Now, there's also, and there'll be, more, I'll talk more about this, but William Gray, a former lover, boyfriend who used to live with David Brock, threatened to rat Brock out to the IRS, except what happened? David Brock paid him off with a substantial $850,000 for his silence. And I have the Superior Court of the District of Columbia documents right here where there were civil action suits filed, and it documents William Gray's payment. Truly amazing stuff. What is he trying to hide? This is very erratic behavior. Now, this goes further. Not only is David Brock trying to use media matters to manipulate the news, he is also, he founded, and he's not tied into this anymore, but he founded a pack that pays people to go online and be trolls. It pays people to go online and dissent with conservative viewpoints. Now, this is something we can see on all sides of the table. The difference is people aren't paid by Donald Trump or paid by Donald Trump's super PACs to go online and debate in a political discourse between left and right uh, viewpoints. But David Brock is paying people through his super PACs um, it's called, let me see, Correct the Record is what it's called here. Correct the Record, a super PAC coordinating with the Clintons campaign, is spending $1 million to find and confront social media users who post unflattering messages about the Democratic frontrunner. Paying social media trolls. This is truly unheard of. I mean, this is unheard of. This is new stuff. Is this the future of politics? Is this what the Democrats want to see in politics? Now, the amazing thing is, to me, this shows how desperate they are, but... They're paying now millions and millions of dollars to have people go on social media and get engaged in political discourse to defend Hillary Clinton, and they're still losing, folks. It's not even close. So their plan here with the uh, Correct the Record super PAC is not working. You can see that anytime you go to YouTube. You can look at it on Twitter. It's not working. Now, here's a here's a... Uh, a pie graph of correct the record and where they spend their money, folks. The vast major majority of their money, over two and a half million dollars so far in just this political campaign cycle, went to salaries. These are people who say, I mean, they're essentially, you know, communists who tell you that they want to share the wealth. They're not in it for the money. This is the correct the record you can see here highlighted. These are the funds that go towards the salaries of the workers in the super PAC movement. Now, does this include the social media trolls or is just this the people who run it uh, like Elizabeth Cohen, who is now running the organization that was originally founded by David Brock? Now, David Brock is now also being cited for exhibiting very erratic behavior it's been reported that he travels around with basically mafia-style, third-world dictator security detail. Who travels around with detail like this, folks? The biggest crime bosses in the world. People who steal millions of dollars or political people like Hillary Clinton, uh, who were told, you know, they need the protection because they're involved in politics. But why does David Brock need all of this protection? Why do people come out and make reports talking about how he's worried that snipers are going to snipe him when he's on the roof of his apartment? It is truly unbelievable. Now, you can go back and you can look at David Brock's history. He can be tied to the firing of Don Imus back in 2007 with the co-op he, he ran with Media Matters. Um, and, of course, what does he do? He goes after and he reaches out to the NAACP, the National Association of Black Journalists, and Al Sharpton. They go out and attack Don Imus. What happens? Don Imus is then off the air. He also did the same thing to Lou Dobbs on CNN as part of the Drop Dobbs campaign. He called up and threatened that he would run negative ads uh, in in 
accord to Ford Motor Company in Spanish languages in many parts of Texas if they didn't pull Dobbs' program from CNN in 2009. Lou Dobbs was dropped from CNN. So this guy has had stake in the game for a long time and trying to control the narrative. Now, he's also contemplated suing Fox for illegally obtaining journalist phone records. Of course, he never went through with that because a report came out that he himself and media members were also doing the exact uh, same thing. So David Brock is obviously scared. He doesn't want people hacking into his phones. He doesn't want people, he doesn't want people to shoot him. He's so nervous about snipers getting him on his roof. And why? Because he's tied into the Clinton campaign and he's laundering millions of dollars, folks. If this is true, if he's taking, if 12.5% of all contributions are going to the Bonner Group, and you can see how he twists this and this money just goes back and forth before all of these people, uh, you'll see how he's laundering money. Folks, he's also an author. Now, it's strange. This is a strange history. He came up bashing the Clintons. He could also be tied to the eventual impeachment of Bill Clinton. And then all of a sudden, he is against the right wings and he's a liberal. So that is going to do it for tonight's nightly news. Thanks to everybody who tuned in. Be sure to tune in tomorrow night at 7 p.m. Central where we will be doing follow-up reports on David Brock and the money laundering scheme that they're trying to hide.